Hey guys, welcome back to the last video in this series of setting up your carbine. Uh, what we're going to talk about this time is optics, setting up the proper optics on your weapon. And first thing we're going to dive into is iron sights, okay? So the biggest thing I start with with iron sights is a question. Do you even need them? Okay, because that's the big controversy nowadays. Um, I take a look at my lifestyle, how I'm employing a carbine, whether it's home defense, in my vehicle, whether I'm a law enforcement officer, I'm in the military, and then we start to go from there. Now, what I'm going to share with you is a very simple formula that might help you make that determination of what you need. And that formula is very easy. It's, it's what do you need to do and what's the risk you're about to take? And we put that over time. Is time working for you or against you? Plus, okay, plus resources available equals your decision to act. So let's give you a scenario to help you out with this. If you're a home defense or you're in CQB and you have your irons folded down, okay, and I see a threat, maybe he's coming down my hallway or something, and I come up with my optic to, to, to get a sight picture on him and my red dot is not working. Now, is time working for you or against you in that situation? Well, it's working against you, obviously. So what do you need to do right now? Do I have time to flip up my irons? Well, number one, that could take time. It could actually make noise. It could compromise you. And do you have resources available? Um, resources could be the iron. So if time is working for me, well, then maybe I'll, I'll pull them up really quietly. But even you can hear that click right there on some of these optics, especially if it's spring loaded. You got to be careful of that. But if time is working against you, have you ever practiced turning your optic off on the range and doing up drills? Just simply coming up and trying to acquire your sights through the tube, as we call it, shooting through the tube or shooting through the box if you're running like an EOTech or something, and seeing what your hit probability is. And you'll be surprised at how accurate you can be back to you know good CQB distances. I would push the limits back to like 25 to see what your, your optic's capable of doing if you forgot to turn it on or it had an automatic shutoff feature, or worst case, your battery's dead. So that's the thing. Those are resources available, but do you have the time? So what do I need to do right now? I need to get a sight picture on this guy. So don't forget that that tube could be a sight picture. Now this is why typically if I have the ability to run a front sight up, it's just a personal preference. I'll keep my front sight up on the gun. And that way I have two reference points. I can see the front sight right now and I can see the tube with no dot in it. So that helps me acquire that sight a little bit better. The other thing that helps you there is the cheek weld. You're consistent repetition and bringing the sights up on target to that cheek weld creates what we call proprioception, you know, knowing where your limbs and these levers are in any given space. So the more you do that in life, the easier it's going to be to do that. And that's why we say deliberately practice with your optic off just to, just in case of worst case scenario. All right. So now talking about irons a little bit more in depth, is it a backup system or is it still a precision system? Well, it certainly depends on the optic that you buy from whichever manufacturer. Now, me personally, again, and what we're sharing with you is I like to find an optic that works in both cases. It can be a backup in worst case scenario, or I can actually use it out to distance because just like we used to do back in grandpa's day, running M1 Grands or M14s or M16 A2s, we can be extremely accurate with those iron sights. So I do like to find the windage and elevation adjustment that's consistent with what I'm familiar with in my Marine Corps days is shooting the A2 iron sight system. So I can still dial up if I need to. I can still dial in windage if I need to and still hit precision back out to 500 yards if I absolutely had to. Because if I'm out on patrol, optic goes down, well, guess what you got left? So that's a resource available that I would use in that situation. If you don't need optics, which you're starting to see a lot of guys out there running carbines without optics or iron sights on it because they're putting a lot of trust in today's technology, the durability, the reliability of some of these optics out there. Uh, you're seeing military guys not running them, but that is their personal choice, okay, that they get to do. They get to choose that. So you have to, again, ask yourself, what do you need? What's going to happen under the worst case scenario, time is life, do I have resources available here? If you don't need that, well, then you're, and you're proficient at shooting through the tube, and you're never going to go out in a long-range patrol environment, it's just a home defense carbine, then you might be able to get away with that. So always just ask yourself those questions of how you should set your carbine up based on your shooting lifestyle. As far as uh, sight alignment and sight picture goes with the iron sights, obviously we're not going to get into that right now, but we're talking about setting up the carbine. We want to go back into the first video, just setting up our stock. Okay, That stock is going to determine how those irons have a proper eye relief, and this is where the nose to charging handle kind of comes into play. 
So a lot of people I see zero their optics, their red dots, with a nose to charging handle kind of technique and they'll adjust their stock based on that principle. You guys gotta remember that that nose to charging handle reference point is simply for the A2 eye relief, okay? The distance from your eye to that peep sight back here. So that is important to know. If you're gonna use iron sights, you do need to have a reference point to make sure you have a proper eye relief because if you're too far back, the sight's not gonna align the way it was designed. So just as another, another little tip there for you. Okay. Okay, now we're gonna talk about actual optics. So people ask me a lot, well, what type of optics should I use? What, what should I buy? And I think that's a loaded question, right? Because it certainly depends back to that formula again that I shared with you just a second ago. What's your shooting lifestyle? Um, you know, of course, there's, there's all different types. We've got fixed power, variable power, red dots, and, and all these other optics out there. I would say the most versatile optic and the most adaptive optic out there is a red dot optic because you can do a lot with it. Uh, you can use it as a standalone. You can put a three by magnifier on it if you need more magnification. But I call it the most versatile and most adaptive because when time is life, if time's working against me, how fast can I be on the gun? So that's where the red dots come into play. Uh, as well as when time's working for me and I'm at distance, what's my capability with that red dot as well? So we're going to talk about other optics here, but as far as the red dot and what it's capable of doing, I want to try to get, break this mindset out there that people think it's only a CQB optic, and that is not the case. Uh, this optic can be used at precision at, at great distances, as long as you understand it. So like, for an example, when we do our classes, we take time in the mornings sometimes hours on the first day just to dial in at zero. And that does not mean just because we're on a short range, we go at zero to 50 and call it done. Um, just like, you know, in the military, they don't go out and just get a combat zero and then call it good. They confirm it at 50, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, even farther if you have the capability. So like in our classes, we push out to 750 yards here on our ranges. So a lot of people go, whoa, you can't shoot a, a red dot accurate out that distance, which we confirm with that data and show that that's not the case. So when you get that zero, you need to go back and confirm it, okay? So what is your optic doing if you zero to 50 and then I took you to 400 meters, would you know where your bullet impacts? Now, of course, you could pull out a, a ballistic calculator and, and get it, but that doesn't mean it's gonna be accurate because the bullet never lies. We've got all these different barrel lengths. We've got all these different great ammunition um, manufacturers putting out all these different types of bullets that we can load through these carbines you've got to test that bullet. And then you put training ammo in one gun one day, and you put your carrier duty ammo in the next, you're gonna have a different point of impact at all those distances. So you have to understand that. So we take these optics, we confirm it, and we push it back a distance. And what my goal with, it, with my red dots is, how far can I put a red dot on a man's chest and pull a trigger? Meaning, can I hold that, that dot on his chest at 300 meters, pull a trigger, and have a combat effective hit in this area? And the answer is yes, if you zero the gun correctly. And then when do I need to start holding over? Okay, so we know like with most of these guns at 400, I'm gonna be hitting around the, the thighs and the knee area. At 500, I'm gonna be splashing around the feet in most cases. Of course, if you have a heavier bullet and a shorter barrel, you're gonna to have to hold over more. So you have to understand that in case you ever need to push your carbine that far. And I know there's a big mindset out there where people, especially in law enforcement today, will say, well, we never really will ever shoot past 50 meters. We know that's not the case with all the active shooters and things that are happening in today's world. And I know in this area in Arizona, we've got one of the farthest carbine shots and it's beyond 300 meters um, with a patrol rifle. So yes, you can be in that situation, and which is why we need to understand our machine, our optics as much as possible. So it's the law of everything. Know as much about this thing as humanly possible. That's why you gotta test it. And the last thing I'll say it again, the bullet never lies. So make sure you understand what that optic's capable of doing. At that point, then you could put three by magnifiers on it if you need to see better, because of course, yeah, the better you can see, the better you can shoot. But is time working for me or against me is gonna determine whether I put that three by up or not. So when I'm running around with a red dot carbine, I want the speed, because I could be out in, in open desert, but some guy pops up behind a rock at five meters, I'm now in close quarters combat. So what is my ability with speed at that point in time to take that guy out? If I see a guy running at three, 400 meters, well then maybe I can flip up my magnifier or get a little bit higher level precision at that point in time. Um, so that, and we'll talk about how that carries over into some of these other optics as well. As far as mounting the optic on the carbine, um, you see a lot of different people talking about a lot of different places. And what I like to do is, is just make it very simple. Find a neutral point on the carbine. Now, these optics are super lightweight nowadays, the optics and the mount combinations. 
So you don't have to go, well, I got to put it back so I've got a better balance. You don't really have to worry about that as much unless you're running like a larger, larger red dot optic and the weight is something you're trying to take in consideration there. What I care about is how fast I can bring the carbine up on target so my eye works fast with the optic. If you put it too far forward like we used to do, well, it's faster, but it doesn't come up into the target line until, or the eye line until the last second. So you also have a weight issue potentially up front on the carbine as well. If you put it too far back towards the eye, a lot of people think, well, if I put it back here, I'll have a better field of view. Well, that might be the case, but again, you're getting the optic first, but now you have potential material of destruction. So if your optic's small enough and you don't have the material obstruction there from the, the actual housing of the optic, well then sure, you could probably get away with that. But I like to find that neutral point in the middle for balance and for speed and acquisition of the way my eyes work coming up on the target. As far as mounting it up or down now, okay, that's important to know as well. Uh, you hear the term co-witness. Well, I don't just go off of co-witness off the iron sights. You can certainly do that in a hasty sense, meaning that you're out in combat, you, your optic gets shot or blasted, or your optic fell off, you put it back on real quick. You can certainly get a quick alignment if your, op, if your iron sights are zeroed, but that's not what I go off because this is a standalone optic. You only use this optic by itself. I don't line it up with the front sight or the rear sight. So in that case, do you want a lower third, uh, it's kind of centered in the optic or absolute, or do you want a higher third? Well, that's gonna depend. For me, I prefer to have a lower third co-witness, which means that these iron sights sit in the bottom of the optic down here. So I've got a wider field of view. There's nothing obstructing my vision there. Even when my optic's up, my laser's on, I still see very clearly through because of the sight height that I, I decided to choose with this particular mount. If I'm running a carbine that has a higher rail system, like some of the piston guns out there, a SCAR is a great example of that, or an HK416 or MR556 type rifle, which has the piston in there, you may want to go a little bit lower because the optic's already sitting up higher. So now when your cheek well comes up, that's also going to determine how fast does the optic come into my eye line. Well, you might need to get a little bit lower optic mount there. Okay, so again, that's going to depend mostly on the gun you're running. Uh, you're starting to see a lot more PDWs come out. So if I was to take like this 300 blackout gun, for example, which is a really short gun, and take this stock off and put a PDW stock, well, that PDW stock sits a lot lower on the gun. So that means my cheek well might be a little bit lower, which means I might be able to get away with a lower mount. Specifically, if I want to conceal it in a bag and have this nice tight weapon system I could pull out, well, my cheek rides lower, my optic rides lower, and I still have a perfect co-witness of the weapon system. So that's something you can take in consideration if you start mounting different style stocks on your gun. So again, those are the things that determine where your optic sits on the rifle. The next type of optic we'll find that we can run on a carbine optic is a fixed power like this ACOG. I love ACOG optics. It's a, it's a very well built and uh, rugged optic. Um, but keep in mind, it's fixed. So you can certainly learn a couple different ways to shoot this because we're talking about speed first, right? If time's working against me, in this fight formula here, how fast can I bring the gun up and, and be on target? So what I like to do with these is if you don't understand the bending aiming com concept that uh, Trigicon will put on their, their website, you certainly go there and watch their videos and try to learn that process. It is difficult for a lot of people to get down though. Um, that means basically trying to get your focal plane downrange on the threat. So when we have a stress sight picture happening, which is what happens under the body alarm response, when you have the celery muscles inside the eye contract for distance focus, which pretty much eliminates the ability for a near focus, it makes you force through the optic. But what happens when you put magnification up in front of your eye, you can get sucked through that tube. So they try to teach you to look past it with your other eye. And it, it, is, it does work. However, the body alarm response is very complex and we're still trying to understand it on a daily basis. So a simple solution, if you can't get that down or you have eye dominance issues or something else going on there, you can put a cap on the front of your, for your fixed power scope. And now when I turn my electronic ACOG on, which I have here, or run the fiber on top, I have basically an occluded gun sight right now. So now with it set on setting four, and I come up, I see my green crosshairs in this 300 blackout reticle. I come up and it's now basically an occluded gun sight or a red dot. I'm just looking past. It automatically forces my eye down range for distance focus. So now, Time's working against me. I come up, I've got a basically a red dot system, a very quick target acquisition site. If a guy comes out of distance, I can take a piece of duct tape, which I used to do in the military when I was issuing an ACOG, and I can rip this tape off, and now I can go back into my scope and use 
my BDC, I can get a higher level precision and increase my hit probability out of distance. So that's just a quick tip that you can do on your fixed power optics if that helps you out there. Some other optics that we've got are your variable power optics. So you see a lot of Elkans out there in the military. This is basically not a, a dialing variable power. It's set one power, quick throw of the lever, gives you four power. Great concept because I can be in that one power mode right now and have the speed. If I need the distance, I flip it to four and or six depending on the optic you have. And of course I can switch back and forth and I have minimal or ex uh, the excessive or waste motion of my hand and my body trying to dial this thing in is, is minimized. So that might be a good option for you there. Just sometimes it can be a little expensive. Variable power optics as far as uh, like one to fours, one to sixes, obviously they're very popular. Same concept happens there. And you'll see on some of these, you can get a much clearer, truer one power when you're set on one versus on four or six, obviously, uh, or compared to other variable optics out there. So this is a Vortex Razor. So when I come up, I'm on one power. I still have a little bit of parallax, a little bit of scope shadow that could pre prevent me from having speed when time's working against me there. So what I like to do when I'm running variable powers is I always have a set of offsets or a offset optic as well. So like right now I've got a T1 on the side. So when I'm working through a, a tactical scenario and I'm going into a house, I'm coming out of a vehicle and I'm in a close fight, I will keep the weapon system like this and I'll practice at that 45 degree angle with this cheek weld here to try to build the proprioception equally between this optic and this optic. And that way I'm not getting sucked through the tube and I can literally keep this on six power if I wanted to and run around with my red dot on and then switch back and forth depending on the time in the fight formula. Working against me, well, red dot. Working for me, I might need a higher level of precision, okay? And then you can certainly offset your iron sights as well. So I've got more of an intermediate range system or a battle rifle here. This M110 SAS with a, with a Mark VI on it. Um, I've got my iron sights on the side. So if I'm gonna go into a situation where I gotta clear through a house or go up a pair of stairs to get to a higher level a position to shoot from, I'm gonna again run like this so I have those irons. And I'll still set this optic maybe on one if I forget to put these up. And when I get to that position, I can dial in that six or eight power, whatever I need, I can simply dial it from here. So again, those optics do work in tandem. And they, of course, hopefully uh, give me the ability to work in both of those situations, worst case scenario, or hey, I've got time working for me and I can get a higher level of precision, guys. So. Again, quick nutshell on optics and what to look for, how to potentially set them up, depending on your lifestyle. Don't forget the formula. What do you need to do right now? What's the risk you're about to take? Is time working for you or against you? Plus your resources available. Resources available are not just the optics, not just the gun, it's also here, it's tactics, okay? Just because your gun's multicam or it's got a bunch of cool shit on it doesn't mean you have tactics on board. Tactics is the decision that somebody makes in combat that determines their success or failure, so don't forget that. Okay, but do I have the other resources next that allow me to be successful and increase my survivability and reduce liability in a bad situation? Okay guys, so that's it on optics right now. Stay tuned for a whole new series of videos coming that we're gonna dive even deeper in on some of these things out on the range. I'm Travis Haley, stay sharp, be safe. Thanks for joining me.